Recording in progress. So welcome to the December 21st curriculum subcommittee meeting of the Brookline School Committee. Um, this meeting is being recorded so that everyone on the call knows as well as being recorded for um, big so that it can be broadcast for folks who can't join us today. The first item is the um, review um, and vote on the minutes for them from the November 16th meeting. Um, has everyone had an opportunity to review them and would anyone like to move them? All right, I will move them. I have read and reviewed them. Would anyone like to second them? I will not second. Okay, so I got both Susan and Helen simultaneously. So uh, Robin, you can note as, uh, as you wish. Um, the, we are going to be making, just for members of the public, um, we're gonna make a, a small um, change, it, well, not a change in the agenda, but a change in the position of items on the agenda. Um, and so right now we're going to um, change the Office of Teaching and Learning Goal Status Update with the Social Studies Curriculum Re Review for Equity and Cultural Responsiveness. Um, and we have, um, I'm gonna turn it over, Leslie, to you for that part. We have, um, I said, I believe you, Keith is joining us for this. Dr. Lozama is joining us as well. Okay, yes. great. Yes, perfect. Thanks, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, really excited for this meeting. Um, you know, I know a lot of times we talk about, um, um, of course, uh, areas of strength um, in our work in the Office of Teaching and Learning, as well as areas for growth. Um, and today, um, we have a lot of successes to share with you all. Um, I feel like a lot of times math and ELA um, get a lot of the airtime, and I'm really excited um, to talk about science today today um, and also give you some updates as to where our work is in the Office of Teaching and Learning, um, as well as talk about a really exciting um, curriculum review that is underway in social studies that is made possible by METCO funding. Um, so I think, um, you know, there's a lot of departments within the Office of Teaching and Learning. Um, and so, uh, again, a lot to celebrate and then also um, just sharing some of the ways that we're collaborating within the department. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get things started. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, a review, a curriculum review that is happening. Um, it is a review of curriculum materials and cultural responsiveness in our social studies curriculum. Curriculum. And so Gabe McCormick, our secondary uh, uh, senior director of secondary education, is really leading that work along with Dr. Lazama. And so Keith, well, actually, let's do this. Let's let Gabe talk a little bit about what the work is. And then, Dr. Lazama, I'm going to pass it on to you to talk about the why, and then we'll take any questions. Sound good? Sounds okay, good. Gabe, to you. Yeah, so this will be a review looking at social studies in grades six through 12. Um, so really thinking about middle school and high school, right? This is when we have dedicated social studies teachers. And so part of the, the thought is about um, the curriculum materials we use, but then also how we take advantage of the content. Um, and so kind of balancing what we need to do from the state standards and to make sure students are appropriately prepared. Um, don't wanna to get too sidetracked on this, but we do have MCAS exams coming in social studies in the next few years. Um, and so we need to be conscious of that, but not let that over, overtake us completely. Um, and I don't think we need to, but we really wanted to make sure that our program is serving all of our students and social studies hasn't had a thoughtful kind of district-wide comprehensive look in quite a while. And, um, you know, we had an opportunity to talk to Greg Porter and Gary Schiffman, the two curriculum coordinators for the subject, and they seemed really excited about the opportunity and kind of the chance for folks to look really like in a detailed way of, you know, is our content representative? Are we treating all the people we talk about with dignity and respect? Right? I mean, as you all know, my background is in social studies, and the thing I say a lot is social studies is about people. And so we need to, need to make sure that people were examining and studying are treated well, um, and that our students have a really positive experience, which I think is what Keith is gonna talk about a little more. Great, thank you, Gabe. Um, so as we all know, MECO is a fabric of the public schools of Brookline, and the work that we do within our MECO program to enhance the experiences of our MECO students have a 
direct impact on all students. Um, I'm super excited about the partnership with OTL to conduct this program and curriculum review. I think it's going to allow us to really take a deep dive into the daily work that we do. Um, but also what's important with this work is that it is our responsibility to rid our curriculum of the biases and the inequities that exist. Um, so I'm happy to get this work started. Um, when we talk about MECO funds, I just want, this is like Brookline MECO funds and part of the work that we do. Um, and what I'm really excited about with Leslie being on board is that it's all about all of our students. So how do we create a curriculum where um, all of our students are seen in a curriculum in a way they feel inspired, valued, and respected. So super excited about this work and um, can't wait to kick it off. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And, and I'll just add, you know, it's not it's not a program review. It's the review of the curricular materials. Um, and so, you know, for those of you who have been on the school committee for some time, I know you know that, that when we, um, Many times when we run up against biases in our curriculum materials, it tends to be in social studies just due to the content. And so one of the things that I just will never forget from the time that Beverly Daniel Tatum um, came for the equity uh, uh, PD day is she said, listen, it's really important that everyone sees themselves in the curriculum and they see themselves looking good. And so, um, you know, that has really resonated with me and we wanna make sure that our materials are free of bias um, and uh, present all um, people. Um, of course, we want them to state history accurately, um, but that people are presented in a positive light and um, uh, whenever that is possible. Um, and so we're really hoping um, very much like the middle school review um, that we will get a reputable organization um, that will come and support us with this work. Um, and again, I think it's necessary. It was just a couple of weeks ago, um, I got an email from a parent around one of our texts in uh, 10th grade US history um, that made some claims around a slave owner being paternal um, and giving uh, slaves a level of autonomy autonomy. Um, and that's just not, that, that's not accurate. And so we, those are the types of indubious uh, uh, references and bias, biases that we want to rid our curriculum of. Um, and so one of the things I'm super excited about is that we've had a couple of organizations already bid on the project. Um, and one um, uh, proposal in particular looks really promising um, and really good. It looks like they can do some thorough work for us. Um, so just wanted to let people know, you know, I, I neglected to share um, this work. We've just been so busy. And so um, as we thought about celebrations um, that we would share during this meeting, this was one that really rose to the top that we're getting some movement on. Uh, so just wanna see if there are any questions. Can I just add one more quick thing just about the framing and part of how we put the bid out is that we want this to be collaborative with educators. Um, because we know that there are educators who have made adjustments to their instruction, right? To, to balance out materials that are maybe harder to change, right? A whole textbook purchase is incredibly expensive. And so in order to do that, we wanna make sure that um, educators have a lot of participation so that if there are things that an individual or a couple teachers have done to make adjustments, we can make sure that gets um, known district-wide or program-wide, um, or maybe there's a thing that an eighth grade, um, U.S. history teacher can learn from the 11th grade U.S. history teacher and vice versa. And, you know, given this is METCO funding, um, Keith was really um, uh, instrumental as we created the budget. And so I'm really thankful that he allocated funds um, for our educators to be compensated for their participation in this work. Um, Cause I don't want it to be something that is top down. I want it to be something that's done collaboratively um, amongst the educators um, in that content area that are using the curriculum materials. Jennifer. Yeah, actually, you answered one of my questions. I was just wondering what the collaboration would be between this uh, group that gets the bid um, and the educators. And so I think you sort of spoke to a little bit of that, um, that there'll be some opportunity, direct opportunities for that collaboration to take place, which I think is really valuable. Um, 
I was wondering if you could maybe give us some more information about the time frame for the next steps, sort of when the bids close, when you anticipate bringing someone on board, what, you know, sort of like a rough sketch of what that work might look like. And then also, um, it sounds like this is a six through 12 pro plan. And I was wondering what plans there would be for K-5. Sure. Gabe, I'll let you take that one because I know you sure. created the timeline. Yeah, um, part of what we discussed is that the K-5 educators are going through such a robust math rollout that we didn't want to kind of double up and overwhelm them. This has been sort of a historical pattern, right, when departments don't talk to each other, so we're trying to avoid that. Um, and because, again, like 6 through 12, they're dedicated subject area teachers, so they, they can focus all their attention on social studies. Um, so in terms of timeline, um, the bids have closed and we're in the process of reviewing them. So, um, you know, I would, assuming things go quickly, I think just given the holidays and the time to like actually negotiate a contract, I think the earliest work would start would be probably February, just realistically. Um, that might be ambitious. Maybe it goes quicker if a organization is like really quick with getting the details in and we don't have to go back and forth a lot. And this is obviously work that can extend into the summer and can extend into other periods as well. So it's not like it has to be wrapped up by June. We have some flexibility given the nature of MECO as a funding source. So do we think that we might come back to this for K-5 at, at a future time and do some of this work? Is that the thought process that- Yeah, I know from my discussions with Greg Porter, the new K-8 social studies coordinator, as I'm kind of mentoring him and supporting him, um, He's really interested in taking a deep look at K-2 um, and the specific materials we have there. And so I think that's probably TBD a little bit. And we do have a draft of a very similar proposal for the elementary grades. Um, but like Gabe said, we just chose to move forward. High school was ready. We had talked to um, Gary Schiffman. He was on board, um, felt like it was a, a good time. Um, and so we move forward with that. Um, but we also have a draft of some similar work and METCO's agreed to fund that work as well. So we're very thankful for that. Um, you know, and one thing I'll just mention, um, you know, we've got the middle school review, we have this review. Um, and so one, I wanna separate them from program reviews program reviews are much larger. Uh, well, well, the middle school review is gonna be large, so let's keep that real. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that I think is just really important to me coming into this role is that I'm able to present you all and the community with baseline information as to where we are so that we can be really clear as to what's working, what are areas for growth, and then we can just be really strategic in thinking about how we're moving forward. Um, because I think when we make adjustments and changes, we need to be making the right changes and we need to have a laser-like focus on those adjustments that we're going to make. And so while I know it might seem like a lot of reviews, I think it's a, a good time as Dr. Guillory um, is doing his introductory meetings with folks um, for us to also be using this time to gain um, information uh, that will then help us to decide it on our next, um, our next path uh, forward. Did any other members of the committee have questions, Susan? So first of all, thank you for doing this. This is so exciting. I know we've been talking about it for a while um, and it's just great that it's happening in this way. And thank you, Keith, for you know stepping up and thank you, Gabe. Um, a few questions and then just a few other things that I think are, will get triggered in people's minds when um, when we, if to the extent that we're sort of making this um, part of a, a conversation at school committee to let people know what's happening. I think the first is that um, part of the question is gonna be about the, the scope of this in terms of, are we also, are we thinking about, when we talk about everyone seeing themselves in the curriculum, are we talking about race? Are we talking about sex? gender, sexuality, kind of how, how broad is this um, and how narrow is it? So I think that will be one set of questions. I remember there was a conversation in, I think it was seventh grade English or something that they didn't have a single female author the entire year, a couple of years back. And so I think 
think part of just being clear on what those scope and boundaries are would be helpful. I think the second thing is, is that especially grade six through 12, and especially on this, my guess is the students are going to have like an incredible set of um, thoughts themselves. They, you know, what they read on the internet and they, they already probably have a lot more webs out than, um, and so sort of how do we bring in student voice? Like what do they think the gaps are and where do they think that there are representation issues, I think um, would just, I'd be, I'd be really interested in hearing. Um, and, you know, I just think from, this is not something to, this last thing is just a comment. It's not something to do anything about, but given, you know, the ethnic studies legislation in California, given the CRT conversation, which appears to have died down a little bit since the election, um, given conversations about voting rights that we're having, you know, <laughs> this in daily, um, there's, and the democracy project that, um, that just that just kind of came up with their civics curriculum like there are so many like hot buttons here and so some of this i think again just sort of in terms of boundaries and framing of like how is how are we thinking about this in the context of some of those other conversations and the answer may be this really has nothing to do with that it may be <clears throat> that's a really important topic and here's how we're dealing with it um whatever the answer is is fine but i just think that those are the kinds of things that I would imagine kind of are going to come yeah. up, but I'm excited that you guys are doing this. Thank you. Sure. Um, part of the scope questions are going to be negotiated with the bidders. I think that's part of the question is like, can you reasonably cast a wide net and do a thoughtful review? Or do you have to do maybe multiple narrow reviews, um, kind of sub reviews? Like that's part of what we're going to discuss with, with the partners as we think about them. Um, and then regarding students, uh, discussions with students, and um, families are embedded into the, um, the way we put out the RFP. I think because of the nature of, of METCO, making sure we're talking with families and talking with students um, is really critical. And one of the things that we're interested in is how do the experience of students in METCO and their families compare with resident families of color and then resident white families as well. Are there any other members who have questions? Helen? Just a quick question. With the, was it a request for qualifications or a request for proposals that we sent out? I remember reading it, but now I can't remember how we framed it. Yep. We, yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, we sent it out as a request, request for proposals. OK. Suzanne? Yeah, I just, so I'm having a couple of thoughts. Um, so I understand we're not reviewing curriculum. So the, so the content will stay pretty much the same um, as would be my understanding, but it's the actual materials we use, the text we read. Uh, and so it's, it's the thought that there probably may be some materials that we say, uh, you're out, we're not using that anymore. I mean, is that kind of- well, I think that's a fair comment. I mean, the text Leslie referred to is, a text from 2007 that we haven't had an opportunity to update. Um, understanding has changed since 2007. Right. And, but, and uh, what about, do we have, do we have textbooks for, we must have textbooks in some of our classrooms yeah. for classes. So is, will it include that as well? Yeah. All, all materials. Yeah. The book okay. Leslie referred to is a textbook. Yeah. Okay. 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 And then, so then, so this is great, but and I'm thinking now of kind of interdisciplinary projects or schoolwork or teaching, and you know how will how will we look at uh, you know text and other materials and other subjects? Do we have to do each subject by subject? So ELA and science and I don't know math. I don't know that. I will, that may be more neutral, but. <laughs> Is that how it has to, it would have to go? Each subject would have to kind of go through the same review process? Well, I think we'll know more about that once we see how this process goes. I, at least for myself, I'm anxious to go through this to get an idea of what this looks like um, and you know what the timeline looks like, um, what's the amount of work that we're asking educators do to participate so we can think about how we fairly compensate them when we do this again. Um, you know, again, timelines. So um, I, I 
I don't know the answer to, to, I don't have an answer to your question, Suzanne, but I think after we do this first one, we'll better know if we can do multiple curriculum areas in this same way, or if it makes sense to do one at a time. Um, so I think this will also be a learning experience for us. And is there and some of I was just gonna say to your question about the textbooks, um, you know, that, that's, that's interesting because, you know, Gary and I talked a little bit about um, there are pieces of the textbooks that uh, don't necessarily work for us, but then there are some pieces of the textbooks that do work well for us. And so how do we balance that? Um, so I think that's another question we're going to have to explore. And, and that kind of a follow up to my question, which was, you know, do we have criteria? I mean, some of it's controversial. Uh, you know, some people think, no, that it's an okay text or an okay piece of writing. And other people say, no, no, it's, it's, that's not cutting it. We can't do it. And so, or there could be, in, the, in the, as you say, Leslie, in a text, it could be some of it's okay and some of it's not okay. Uh, yeah, and that's part of what we'll work with the, the partner on and, um, Part of our idea is that, you know, obviously Greg and Gary as the curriculum coordinators will be involved in that vetting and negotiation. And then um, if possible, maybe a couple of teachers um, so that we can, we can set those ground rules, right? So that we get the review we need. Yeah. Have other districts done this that we know? And I can't speak to like a specific process, but certainly districts work with consultants, um, even like Jeff Tegnell, who used to work for us, has been hired as a consultant to review curriculum materials. No, I meant, yeah, I understand we review curriculum materials, but we're doing it for the purpose that we're doing now. Do we know of any other districts around us who've done it? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, Helen. Yeah, I, can't. Yeah, I don't either. And it's a shame Edco isn't around to, to ask no. it, because that's where it would be in. Uh, well, I can speak question. on the MECO piece. The, I have not heard from any of my peers, MECO directors, of the partnership with their Office of Teaching and Learning to do um, a review of this magnitude. I think, and I, I feel very comfortable to say that we are the first district to do this work wow. in partnership with our district and senior leadership team. And I think that's what makes this very important, that collaboration, and then looking at how do we improve the academic culture for all students in, in our district. So I, I feel very comfortable to say this is the first time that we have, that this has happened, and especially using MECO funds in order to um, make this possible. Well, um, I'm sorry, David, I just saw your hand. Um, as part of this process, is there a mechanism where we can make sure that the state standards are in like our that our standards match the state standards by grade level? Will that be part of this review as well as the curriculum to make sure that we're in alignment so that we're teaching the right thing at the right time? Does that make sense? And then after you, it looks like Gabe's gonna answer and then David, if you wanna go. I think from the content standards, I, I feel good about saying yes to that. I don't expect that this review will get to sort of like the, the more skill-based standards that are like on the report card. Um, so, from the, the content side, which is really what the state standards in social studies look like. They're heavily content focused. But doesn't the state have a different uh, sequence for history, for no. social studies? No, because oh, no. at one point there was a problem where we were doing something in one grade. Yeah, we are, our current six to 12 program in terms of course sequence is aligned with the state. I okay. Yes, I think what you're getting at, Helen, is the presentation that we made last year. And during that presentation, we showed you where we're out of alignment. We're working to get back to that alignment, but it doesn't preclude the current materials that teachers have that, that we can still look at. So I think they're sort of two separate projects going on. That, that alignment was also at, at the K-5 level, or that misalignment was at the K-5 level. It was just K to five. It wasn't uh, okay. Because yeah. at one point I thought we were doing tenth grade U.S. history. Are we still doing? We're U.S. history doing is eleventh grade. Eleventh grade. Yeah, nine world and ten. World history one and two, right? Nine and nine and ten are world history one and world history two. Right. 
Okay, great. David, did you want to speak? Yes, I'm just wondering to what extent will educator input be solicited as a part of this process? And is there a methodical process in place for how to do that type of outreach? Yep, that's a great question, David. And so um, we were just saying that that will be included, that um, one of the things that's really important, I think, to all of us, Keith, um, Gabe, myself, Gary, is that educators are a part of the process and don't feel like it's something top down happening to them. Um, we really want to make sure that their feedback is included, um, because also we will also uh, be able to assure their buy in um, into the work. And also, if there are any recommendations or commendations that um, the, the, the educators are uh, in agreement with those and prepared to implement them. Um, we're really looking to the consultant to help us decide what those focus groups look like and a structure for incorporating both um, parent feedback and educator feedback back. So that's something that we also included in the proposal um, as an outcome um, was just their ability to uh, to uh, organize and structure feedback sessions so that um, you know we, we get a wide breadth of uh, uh, feedback from folks. Great. Well, thank you for this information to keep us updated um, as the process continues. It's really exciting work. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming and sharing with us. And I don't see any other hands and I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. Um, is there, do, are there any other questions before we move on to another agenda item? All right, great. Well, I look forward to hearing how things go once everything's settled with the consultant and work begins. So we look forward to hearing some more updates as the year goes on. Um, thank you so much. I think we'll transition to the Office of Teaching and Learning um, up goals update. Um, so Leslie, that's, that's you. Sure. Um, so there are really um, uh, four updates that we thought we would share with you today. Um, matter of fact, I will make sure that you all have um, our most updated status um, document that we've been sharing with you all. Um, and I'll also make sure that you have the most up-to-date uh, RFP for the social studies uh, curriculum review. So just to um, say that. Um, the first big update is around the middle school um, uh, review. And so I'll pass that to Gabe. And then Michelle has an update around the uh, uh, math investigations implementation update. Um, she's also going to talk a little bit about the dyslexia screener and give an update there. And then I have a CST update. All right, so for the, the middle school review, the RFP is ready to go. However, after talking with our uh, purchasing department, they were basically like posting RFPs in December is a waste of everybody's time. Um, so we're not doing that. Um, based on their recommendation, we're gonna post it uh, first week in January. So um, it delays us a little more than I wanted, but I would rather get some robust RFPs or um, robust proposals and I'm trying to just have to open it again anyway. So we're gonna be reaching out to some folks that we have contact with in a variety of organizations, but then also posting it publicly. Um, no significant updates since you all provided feedback. Uh, so we're just sort of waiting on the calendar a little bit. Um, should be posted for about a month. So we'll be doing reviews in kind of early to mid February. And then, um, you know, depending on how things go, um, we'll be able to update you then. Okay, I'll jump in. Um, so we've been working with um, the Dyslexia Working Group. We've continued to, um, actually the group has grown a little bit. We've added in um, Aaron from the uh, Office of Ass Accountability Assessment because, or I can't remember the name of it, but anyhow, just to sort of be, help us look at the type of reporting that we would get both for uh, families and for teachers and the, and how deep they are and how they connect to our current systems. And we also, um, Leslie and I have been talking with some of the experts, in, oh, and Casey, 
some of the experts and the outside that have been given recommendations to us, and we've been using those recommendations to help inform our conversations uh, for the working group. We have narrowed down to several screeners, and we are in the midst of having appointments with the vendors in order to get enough information and getting some trial sandbox place uh, accounts so that we can do some testing on the inside. And then from there, we'll be able to um, engage some more stakeholders to understand how the system works and what kind of information we get and it doesn't meet the needs that we're looking for. And so uh, we will be back with another update to provide information. Helen, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, so which vendor, which uh, screeners are we looking at? Well, so here's the thing. I still have four people to get their votes. So we did a big narrowing down to, to five and now we're trying to narrow down a little more. Um, some of them included, um, uh, they, well, they all included ones that are on the state site. So um, I don't know if we're ready to say which ones we have. Leslie, are we, should we hold? Um, yeah, go ahead. You can share them. Okay. I just, I didn't want to get ahead of ourselves. So we have. Um, and I say, I, I think we should just qualify it by saying we still have members that need to weigh in yeah, and there's still a lot of work to be done. So I don't, I don't want to put any names out there and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're considering this. We're still in the very initial and this is stage. For screening in kindergarten. So this and... is screening for K to two for sure. So every student in K to two will be put through the screener. And again, the screener is there just to identify if a student is at risk for dyslexia or other reading or other language based issues. And so that is where it starts. And then we are also, as we are looking at the screener, we'll come out with sort of, it's like a roadmap for teachers. So if you find out this from the screener, this is your next step. It may be the next step, maybe CST, it might be some intervention time. It just depends on what we learn from the screener. It does not mean that if a student comes through on the screener, they go right to a special to a recommendation for a special education evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And we're, are we going to include in that? Remember, we had talked last time about including a question uh, for the families about whether or not there's dyslexia in the family. That so so I think that's going to go on the kindergarten screener. This screener is automatic to every student. There may be a way that we can put that information in some. You know, when we double check parent information coming back, I think we haven't. We're not at that point yet. Okay. So yep, that did. I think that will go into the parent for the kindergarten screener though. It is in there. So it we is. didn't screen a kid again after kindergarten. I mean, that would be one universe of students who've been screened. It's just new students coming in. No, first and well, second. No. no, because some of the issues. So here's the thing. Dyslexia is a very broad top term. So mm -hmm. what we have to do is a student may come in with a certain set of, of um, skills that they've honed, take the screener, look fine, goes to the okay. next year and those skills, the next set of skills that we need to develop are not fine. And so, so we want to just like, I see it as like sort of a, I call it the sieve. So the first year we put everybody through the sieve, we've got some rocks that stay in the next year, the holes in the sieve, you know, change and you get a few more rocks. And it's not like we're good. We don't expect that we're going to be identifying tons and tons of students this way. But what we are going to see is that if we've been missing students in our dyslexia work, we're getting there. Well, we whatever the proportion is in the population, which I don't remember. Right. Say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Sorry, didn't hear you. Oh, my. <laughs> nope. Now we don't hear you at all. <laughs> no. Um, yes. my, no, my uh, pods disconnected, but I think they're okay now. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. We should have the same as the proportion in the population. I would assume. Pretty yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, but the other thing is, is being able to identify, you know, if there are other reading issues that, that are appearing as dyslexia and we don't try to work through them first and we send students right on to a dyslexia evaluation, we're sort of going to miss, you know, that plays into the over identification in our disproportionality report. So 
I think what we're trying to do is just sort of back up and say, how do we be intentional in our movement there? Okay. Yep. Great. I'm glad we're doing it. Me too. I'm learning a lot. Anybody else before I just give yeah. a, oh, Suzanne, yeah. Yeah, so is this in addition to the BAS? Uh, we've gotten rid of the BAS. Uh, how much testing are we doing in kindergarten and first and second grade? So we need to look oh, at, yeah. Oh, did you want me to go or? Either way, Michelle, I, yeah, I can. So, so I don't think we can say definitively one way or another or anything about the BAS right now. I think what we are determining, and we, we had this conversation yesterday as the working group, we need to determine like what do each of these screeners, you can only get so much information from a vendor website. So we're trying to determine what information do these screeners provide for us? And then we'll overlay that with the BAS to be able to say, and what does the BAS do? And what, inf what information gives us what, what doesn't, because some districts are doing both. They are doing a short screener. So they're looking at the timing and doing a really short screener and they're doing the BAS. Some districts are doing, picking one of the longer screeners and not using the BAS. But I, I think we're too premature to even have that conversation, but I'm gonna to toss it to Leslie before I stick my foot in my mouth. <laughs> No, I mean, I just think that it's a great question, Suzanne, and I think we're just really trying to be intentional. We don't want to overtest students. We just want to have the information we need to make the correct adjustments to our practice. And so um, as we talk to vendors and we get a better sense of how long do the assessments take, what exactly do they assess, and then compare that to the BAS, we'll have more information. But we are being very mindful of that um, and thinking about what, what will this mean going Going forward, we don't quite know yet, but it could it, it could meet some changes. I just I'll just say I know how frustrating it is for teachers to feel like they have to spend the first six weeks of school testing. It's really uh -huh. it's really hard. We and we know that's not a very good time for testing because they're trying to you know set up routines and get to know the students. And yeah. so anyway, just I'm glad you're being mindful of that. Thank you. We have to look at all of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what's really interesting about some of the screeners is the way that they're administered. So, you know, the BAS is a pretty lengthy, it, it's a lengthy administration period because you're sitting with a child one on one and having them read sometimes multiple texts, um, especially if they are a very fluent um, and advanced reader. Um, and so really having to weigh like the amount of time that that takes, but also the information that a teacher gets when they're able to sit one on one one with a child and hear them read. Um, so we're just really trying to be mindful of that. But it's it's interesting to look at some of the screeners. Some are um, taken on a computer and they a, a teacher doesn't actually administer them. A child just takes it on the computer and then a, a report is generated. And so I think that's another reason why it's going to be really critical to have some teachers pilot this um, to see what they think about the administration and the information that they get from the screener. Any other questions? We look forward to further updates as you continue in the process. So this is very helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm gonna just shift quickly, just to give you a quick update about something that happened this month with um, two of our schools. We started with our KM1, well, yeah, in both schools it wound up being KM1, uh, classroom teachers participating in a math lesson study. And so there was um, a group of teachers that got together and one was at Pierce, one was at Driscoll. I mean. One day was at Pierce, one day was at Driscoll. I got to spend the day with the Pierce team um, where we had somebody from Turk here who did some mathematics with us and aligned the math to the actual lesson that was gonna be in the classroom, but we did the adult math and then we went and watched the student math and talked about um, what students were learning and what we saw in the classroom and then talked about like what we might do differently next time. And so I thought that that was a great opportunity um, it's very hard to sit back and watch students and not be able to talk to them about what they were doing. But aside from that, um, I think it was a really good uh, experience for the teachers and a lot of moments where teachers was like, I never thought of trying it that way. And so we are continuing this. Um, I know that I think that Baker is the next school that will uh, participate. Mm -hmm. 
And so one of the things we know is that some of the highest leverage PD is job embedded PD, where teachers are actually learning on the job with their children in front of them. Um, and so that was one of the reasons that we wanted to implement the lesson study. Um, but then also we're at a place because of a lack of substitutes where a full grade level release day is just not an option at this point, um, but we really need to continue professional development related to the rollout of investigations three. So we were thinking thinking about what can we actually manage um, that will also um, provide new and relevant learning for our educators. Um, so this is one of the ways that we are moving forward with that work. And we're still offering professional development after school. Um, that's not as well attended, um, but we'll continue to offer it for anyone that can participate. So kind of have these two tracks running at once. Okay. Could you just remind me, I know we redid math curriculum, but investigations we had before, right? Yes. Yes, we've had investigations. Yeah, we've had investigations before, but this is the revised investigations curriculum and it's investigations three. So it's not that different, I would imagine, from two, or is it? No, I don't. I don't think Brookline ever took on two, didn't they? Go. We didn't have, they didn't yeah, have two. So two is significantly different than one. Three and two have some similarities, but the, the faculty in Brookline were never exposed to two. Awesome. Okay. One is very different. And that's K through two. That's K through two. This year, three through five was last year. Okay. Thank you. Any All right. Okay. All right. And I have the last update, which will be a quick one around CST. So as you know, one of the OTL goals is really to leverage our child study teams as a way to mitigate um, the disproportionality um, issue that we're having in special education. And so we had our first meeting with CST leaders, um, had a great meeting. We uh, one of our uh, first action steps was to complete a SWOT analysis, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, and so we got some amazing information from the CST leaders. And I just wanna say that CST work, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's very meaningful, but it's also a lot of work. And so I'm really appreciative to those who have agreed to be on the CST teams at high school, we call it the SIT team. Um, and so there were a lot of areas of success just in terms of the time that teachers have to collaborate around a student. Um, many uh, principals, I'm sorry, CST leaders cited that their principals are very involved in the CST work, which is a huge help as well as the ETFs. Um, in terms of some areas um, for growth and some focus areas that we are going to now uh, talk about as we move forward, um, the CST leaders cited documentation as being a real challenge, that the documentation is long, it's onerous, and um, sometimes deters teachers from presenting a child to the CST team because of the amount of paperwork. So we want to really look at the documentation and see how we can streamline that to get the information we need, but really um, cut down on the, the process and amount of documentation that needs to happen. Um, we heard loud and clear that CST leaders feel like we need a, a more diverse interventions. Um, they say that they have a couple of interventions, but they run out of options pretty quickly and then feel like they're in a really tight spot that they don't have anything else to offer to educators. Um, so we're going to really think about what additional interventions we may want to bring on board that would be most helpful. Uh, they talked about the data collection process and just how we support teachers um, in the data collection so that when they present a student at CST, um, they have all the right information to have a really fluid um, and meaningful discussion. 
Um, and then lastly was some feedback that we got when uh, we attended the CPAC meeting is that parents don't, at least the parents who were at the CPAC meeting felt that uh, there's not really a clear understanding amongst parents what CST is. And sometimes they feel that their child has been brought to CST and they weren't aware of that before the child went to the team. And that's something they'd like to know so that they can offer any relevant information that would be um, helpful in the CST process. Um, so we're thinking about how we can do a better job engaging families in that process and keeping them updated, um, as well as of course, working on the documentation and diversity of interventions and the data collection. So um, can I ask, we're talking, you're talking about streamlining the paperwork. Is there also conversation about um, consistency in sort of the paperwork across schools um, and the consistency of sort of like, I guess what I would call like the protocols of the meeting or the the sequencing of the meeting, what happens and how long you try to spend on certain amount of time um, on each of the sections and, and whether or not that might be consistent across schools as well. Um, you sort of addressed my third question, which was about parents understanding um, the CST process and you know what is the function of that and what are possible outcomes or pathways? Because I do think there's some, um, just some folks who just don't understand that process. Aren't, there's not really an, uh, a mechanism to inform parents um, unless, you know, an educator is reaching out and having conversations. At least there's not one that I'm aware of. So I'm just wondering what that might look like. Um, I'm particularly interested in that consistency piece, the conversations about consistency and paperwork and procedure for the meetings across yep. schools. So there is consistent documentation, but I think the issue is that that documentation is too lengthy. So I think that there was work done to, you know, make things consistent, but I think what we've put out there is not necessarily that helpful. Well, I'm not going to say not that helpful. It's just really lengthy. Um, and so uh, that piece is in place. Um, you know, one of the things we'll certainly return to is Jennifer Fisher Mueller did an incredible job just getting CST off the ground. Um, I've reviewed a lot of the documents that she put together um, and they're just really thorough. So, you know, at some point, I think we really need to return to those documents with CST leaders and update them, figure out what is still relevant for us now, what's working that we might wanna pull from there. Um, so uh, I think that will be a really helpful resource to us. Any other CST questions? Helen? I'm just curious, what is the documentation that goes into a CST meeting? I mean, is it sure. just the teacher's um, report? Or... Well, go ahead. Yep. So it's quite a, a bit of information about the, the child's um, uh, uh, history, um, how they're doing currently in their classes. There's a lot of data that's asked around whatever uh, the area for growth might be for the student. Um, you know, sometimes we ask for, or there's the, the opportunity for teachers to provide work samples. Um, uh, I don't know if I should get more specific than that, but it really just gives us a, a lens into how the child has performed and what may have been successful in terms of an intervention in the past, as well as in, interventions that we've tried that maybe were not successful so that we can rule those out and move on to something else. And I think that that's what speaks to the need for more support around data collection. And the, the, the person in charge of putting that together is the CST coordinator, the teacher? The... Yes, Ooh. the CST leader does that um, uh, uh, in collaboration with both the, the classroom teacher and a CST member who also liaises with the educator that's presenting the child. So I think there are three people that are really integral into the process for even one child. It's the leader, the member of the team who liaises with the child's classroom teacher and the classroom teacher. Who's the member of the team? I'm confused. Yep, so every CST has several members on the team. So it's the leader oh, of the team and the members. I see, okay, thank you. 
No problem. Suzanne? I just had a follow-up question on, because maybe you've said this and I missed it. Who is the CST leader? Is that a general ed person? Is that a special ed person? Who, is that the full-time job? Who is that person? Yep, it's a stipended position. Um, they have more of a differential in their stipend than the CST members. And it could be any, it could be anyone. I've seen it be a gen ed teacher, a special ed teacher. I've seen it be an ETF. I've seen it be a guidance counselor. Um, so there's, it, it is um, open to any educator um, and it varies across schools. And do they generally meet after school? Is that when they yes, meet? Yes, they do, yes. So I'd, like I'd love to talk more about this when we when you get further down uh, the process, so to speak, and and sort of look, you know, what does that paperwork look like? How do you think you might streamline the process? Um, I'd love to have us come back and talk about it when we when we move forward a little bit farther in the process. Um, does that sound reasonable? Of course. Yeah, we're happy to get it. Great. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to, unless there's other questions, I think that's all of them, the four major update pieces. And I want to be really respectful. I see that Emily um, and Ed Weiser are, are here with us and waiting for the science presentation. So I also don't want to limit questions. So if anyone has uh, burning questions, I, we, need, we should address at this time. I don't want to stop that. I don't want to stifle that process, but um, I think we're at a good place to move on to our science presentations. Does that sound okay? Leslie? Sounds amazing. Okay. Um, so um, we have Emily Speck here, who is our K-8 um, curriculum coordinator, and Ed Weiser. Um, he is the department head for uh, science at the high school. And so, you know, initially we were just going to present K-8. to um, There's a lot of um, uh, 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 updates to the standards that we wanted to make you all aware of. Um, but then I thought we would really be remiss if we didn't at least take some time to talk about all that's happening at the high school, especially with the new building. Um, I've had a chance to go over there um, many times and um, it's really incredible to see the teachers at work in their new spaces. Um, so uh, we're uh, running a little bit behind, um, but I'm going to pass it to Emily first, um, and then she's going to walk us through um, actually a presentation that she did with the PTO leaders where we got really positive feedback. Um, so I'm really excited to share that work. Um, and then Ed's going to give us a brief update. So I will turn it over to Emily. Thank you, Leslie, and um, thank you, subcommittee, for having me here today. I'm really excited to... Um, to share all the stuff we're doing in science. Um, because we're a little behind time, I may move through parts of the presentation a little faster. Some of it is review of some of the things that Helen was referring to that we had looked at last year um, in terms of where we are in terms of alignment to the standards. So I'll go through that um, fairly quickly so that I can get to the exciting stuff that we are doing now. So um, I'm going to share my screen so I can show you the presentation. Um, so um, I'm really excited that we are like back in the buildings and doing science the way science is intended with our hands on um, because our mission in the K to eight part of the science program, which I think then Ed picks up so beautifully in the high school is to really create scientifically literate global citizens who can make, um, make a difference in our world and use all of the ways in which we think about and do science um, from the, the very beginning of their kindergarten career all the way through graduation to be, um, to be members of the society that they are going to inherit from us. So that's our mission. And um, the kind of foundation of our mission is what we teach. And that's based on both the next generation science standards and GSS and the math science standards um, and so there was a lot of work being done for decades that created a framework for science education that was then turned into the next generation science standards um, by a collaboration of 26 states. And then Massachusetts took the next generation science standards, put their own little flavor on them and um, released new standards in 2016, which are very closely aligned to NGSS, um, but have 
uh, specific differences. So that kind of gives us the foundation of what we want to teach. And a lot of the research that went into the frameworks um, looked at both what are the kinds of things students need to know about science to be successful um, just as general citizens, to be successful if they go into STEM careers. How do we take these, um, these endpoints, these big ideas, and think about where they fall um, developmentally? How do those ideas develop over time? And so these standards really are based on research and an idea of how we develop scientific thinking over time, um, both uh, kind of what is the development of the idea, the content itself, and also what is the, the development of the child and when they are ready to tackle more and more abstract ideas in science. So that's kind of where we get our foundation from of what we teach. It's really different from the, um, the previous standards that Massachusetts had. So in the previous standards, um, we really, they focused on knowing specific things about science, knowing specific content. Um, there were standards about the scientific method, but it was really thought of as a linear um, process that you started at the beginning and you went through and there was an end point. Um, and the old standards kind of took ideas and put them in different places but didn't think about how that developmental progression that I was talking about, um, how that really spiraled and worked K through 12. So in the new standards, um, they move from just focusing on content to really thinking three-dimensionally. So how do we think about science as a, as a thing that we do? What are the practices of science? What are the core ideas? that we need to understand and need in order to do that science and make meaning of things in the world around us. And then what are these big cross-cutting ideas that link different disciplines within science, so like earth science and physical science, but also these cross-cutting concepts really cut across disciplines as well. So a lot of them have connections to um, other fields of study. So one of the cross-cutting concepts is patterns. And you can imagine there are patterns in literacy and there are patterns in math and there are patterns in, um, in historical events. And so cross-cutting concepts kind of tie things together. They also um, envision science and engineering not as a linear process, but as an iterative process that's ongoing. Um, and they kind of thought about eight different parts of the work that scientists do. And they, they consolidated those into eight practices that students should be um, doing and participating in from the very beginning of their science career. Um, and they really, again, went back to the research and the frameworks and thought about how are we going to make a clear developmental progression for those standards. So there's a lot of um, really exciting and important stuff in these new standards that we want to make sure that we're giving all of our students full access to here in Brookline. Um, oh, sorry, let me, there we go. Um, the, another thing, I'm just gonna speak really briefly about this, but I, um, I was able to work with the Museum of Science last year and do a lot of work with our middle school teachers around this idea of anchoring phenomena. So one of the things the new standards really wants us to do is not um, teach students things so that they know them, but teach students things so that they are making sense of things in the world. And we call kind of the, the, um, the prompts that we give students, these anchoring phenomena. So they're given a phenomena, something that, that's intriguing, that, they, that they're curious about. Um, they use that to uh, generate initial models about what they think are happening. They use it to generate questions that they can then answer through the course of their study. Um, and it really shapes the way they learn science. So it's student driven, um, it's very um, inquiry based and, um, and they're excited to figure things out. So we're really trying to um, not only teach the new standards as they're written, but teach the new spirit of the standards through this use of anchoring phenomena. Um, and we've done some work in the middle school on that and I'm excited about moving that into the K to five. So Brookline alignment, where are we right now in terms of getting to this vision of science education K to eight that we want? So we have some strengths in the program that we have in place right now that are really important and that we wanna build on as we move forward. So we have a strong culture of using scientific notebooks and instruction so that students are making good observations, 
building their understanding over time, kind of creating their own text that they can take with them and refer to. Um, in, our, in many of our K-8 classrooms and our K-5 classrooms, students are engaging in scientific discourse regularly and using that to make meaning, share ideas, um, and practice that skill of being a global citizen, um, making sense of science. Um, and our teachers at all levels really embrace the idea of hands-on exploration and inquiry science. So we have, um, we have the will and we have a lot of the foundational pieces. Some areas for growth is that, and this is what I spoke to last year, um, is that the K-8 science curriculum was last updated between 2010 and 2015. And as I stated earlier, the new standards were adopted in Massachusetts in 2016. So although some of the more recent um, revised units are, are more closely aligned, we have a lot of misalignment between our current, especially K-5 science units and the science standards. Um, we also just haven't had the mechanisms in the last several years to give the K to five teachers in particular professional training about these new standards and how to use phenomena. So um, although we've done some of that work in the middle school, that work still needs to happen at the K to five level. And um, we are not having as many opportunities as I would like right now for our K to five students to design investigations and analyze data. We're doing a lot more prescriptive hands-on work. And I think that we have a lot of opportunity um, for more student-led work in that area. Um, so we looked at this document last year. I won't spend too long on it, um, but one of the things I did when I came in was analyze our current units in, um, against the standards and kind of codified where we were in alignment, where things were happening, but in wrong grade levels and where things were missing. Um, and I'm showing the second and third grade because I'll talk a little bit later. The third grade was really the least aligned of all of the K to five grades and the science standards. And so we've been starting with them as a place to, to begin some improvements um, and bring, begin some alignment to that, um, to that new vision of science teaching. Um, the other thing I want to touch on briefly, because it's come up a couple times, um, is what, how much time does it take to teach science, particularly at the K to five level, but also at the six to eight level. So DASI in their standards um, was one of the only curriculum areas that released some, some time expectations was for science. And they released this table of assumed um, minutes per day. And right now in Brookline, the actual time spent on science varies a lot by school to school and even sometimes by teacher to teacher. But for the K to five level, it's generally below, sometimes well below the, um, the amount that Desi is indicating in this table. At our six to eight levels, um, again, there's some variability, but it's much more comparable. It's closer to the numbers that, um, that Desi requires. And so that does affect um, the choices that we make um, and what teachers are able to do. And there's a lot of factors that contribute to this situation, including um, the fact that Massachusetts and Brookline, um, as part of Massachusetts, has a particularly short school day. Um, scheduling K-8 to buildings is really complex. And so there's a lot of constraints and complexities around that that make it challenging. Um, and we have a really wide variety of rich offerings for students in the, um, in the K to eight schools here in Brookline, um, but each of those things takes time. And so there are continual trade-offs um, that affect our time to do science. So we wanna maximize um, the effectiveness of the time that we do have while also thinking about how can we make that pie for science time a little bit bigger? Um, and how can we, um, with the constraints that we have, make sure that we're having a really robust and um, supportive science program. Oh, I'll do that again. So here are some things that, um, that we're working on now and we'll be continuing to work on to address these areas of growth in science. Um, and I'm really excited about some of them. I'm gonna share my most exciting piece at the very end. Um, but uh, we're starting the process of revising the K to five science units so that they do align better. We wanna make sure that we have standards happening at the grade appropriate grades. We wanna make sure that we're pulling in those content areas and those standards we were missing before. 
And we're starting this year with a pilot at Baker and Runkle, and I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. I just want to check the time. Um, as we had talked earlier about kind of the equity um, piece of curriculum and the importance of that, as we think about new units, we want to make sure that we are um, prioritizing opportunities for students to do things in science. So we want them to be doers of science as much if not more than just knowing science, right? We want them to be the active participants. We want them to have multiple opportunities to design experiments starting from a very young age and building that skill sequentially through their whole K to eight experience. And we want those new units to be designed with being mindful about diverse representations of both who scientists are and who carries scientific expertise in the world and in the, in the classroom. Um, so those will be um, intentionally built into new units as we roll them out. Um, last year, we started some professional development with K to five teachers using funding from the BEF and from ESSER funding. Um, it was focused primarily last year on preparing to, um, to teach in a hybrid setting, but we also use that opportunity to, um, to think about how our resources were representing scientific expertise. And we use that opportunity to, um, to add in some phenomena and add in some more um, experiences for students to actually get to do science. And we are continuing that with additional summer and school year PD. Um, this will be especially important as we roll out new units because um, teachers really need the, the support of professional development to feel confident in um, implementing new units. The other thing that we're doing to kind of think about the time on learning and also because it's just really good teaching and I absolutely love it, um, is we're thinking about integration, interdisciplinary work. Um, and so I am very supportive of any teacher who's trying to think about how do we take science and put it into a project based approach in, in the classroom. Um, and I'm really working to make sure that any resources we provide teachers um, facilitate that kind of thinking and that kind of work um, so that they don't have to do all the heavy lifting on their own. Um, I'm also working with the other coordinators to think about as we create essential curriculum and create a scope and sequence for different grade levels, how do we line things up so that we can maximize those opportunities for integration um, so teachers can be successful for that. Um, and so that lining things up, it's really, it's a baby step. It's the first step of a bigger process of getting to really rich and robust interdisciplinary work. But, um, but if you don't have that step, then, then the next step is that much harder. So some things that we've already done is we've aligned the second grade um, social studies geography unit with the science, the earth science unit, because that allows students to think about landforms and maps, um, both from a social perspective, as well as um, a scientific perspective, like how how do these things impact us as societies and people and how do we represent them as scientists and how do we model them and how have they formed? Um, so I think that allows for some really rich discretions. Um, in fifth grade, we've aligned our energy unit with the nonfiction reading and writing units in ELA. Um, and that allows students who are working on learning about um, kind of the way that we humans use energy and which sources are new, renewable and non-renewable. Um, they can use their research and nonfiction reading and writing skills to build the understanding of the concepts that, they, um, that they're exploring in the science classroom. So we're continuing to look for examples like that um, that allow us to, um, to put curriculum units at the same time um, and allow for that integration. Um, as we do this revision work and we th start thinking about rollout, um, one of the things that I'm working on as the coordinator is looking at what are the curriculum options that we have and how do we make um, choices about those. So historically, the K-8 to curriculum for science in Brookline has all been homegrown units. 
And there's a lot of benefits to homegrown units because you can personalize them to your own context in your place. Um, you can have a lot of teacher voice and buy-in into creating those. Um, but there's also some drawbacks that are particularly hard for newer educators to, um, to pick up and use. Um, they sometimes have um, limited resources and created things. So there's a lot of reinventing the wheel. People are doing the same thing in, in many different places because not all of the pieces are there and ready to use. Um, so we want to balance this idea of the benefits of homegrown units with considering what are some professional curriculum products that would allow me to focus my work on supporting teacher implementation as opposed to lesson writing and would allow teachers to focus on things like differentiation and personalization of the lessons rather than just writing the base lesson. So um, in the pilot and um, in our middle school as well, we are, we are looking at how do we compare the benefits and drawbacks of what we have homegrown versus what's available um, professionally. And we have some, some middle school teachers who are piloting or using um, units from an open source curriculum that's um, being created by a nonprofit, Open Syed. Um, and they are, they've been working on this project for about four years and they're just about um, completed with that. And they're all aligned to NGSS. They all have anchoring phenomena. Um, a few of the teachers who've been using them this year have been really impressed with the quality of critical thinking that their students are producing as a result of their use in those units. So we're looking at that. And all of those units have been awarded the NGSS design badge for being quality curriculum that is aligned to um, the spirit and the content of NGSS. For K to five, um, one of the units that we are, um, that we're piloting is from Amplify Science, which was, there are not many K to five um, science curriculum products out there right now that are aligned to NGSS. Um, and so uh, there's been, a, there's a more of a limited choice for that, but Amplify Science um, of the ones that have, that, that exist and have been reviewed has the highest review rating on ed, refor ed reports. Um, and I'll go through the third grade pilot in just a minute, but the teachers have been really um, pleased with the, the unit that they've been trying out this year. And they're really excited with, um, with what that's allowed them to do in the classroom and with their students. Um, so now I wanna bring it all together and talk about my baby this year as uh, Leslie and Michelle know, which is this third grade pilot. So I have teachers at the whole third grade team at Baker and the whole third grade team at Runkle are graciously piloting with me this year two really exciting units. Um, and it's been great to work with them. And I'm really excited about what we're learning from that pilot. So um, the, um, we started with third grade, as I said, because they were the least aligned and they were, um, they had a couple units that were completely missing from our standards. So the two units that we're gonna talk about didn't show up anywhere in the standards. And, and so it was a um, right place to start and make a lot of impact um, on, the, um, on the alignment. So we have the teams at Baker and Runkle and they did one unit from a professional curriculum. And then we worked together this summer to write a unit together. And part of the pilot is to look at the drawbacks and benefits of using a professional curriculum versus writing one together. My, um, my hunch is that we will probably end up with a hybrid solution where we do a little bit of both depending on, um, depending on the topic and the capacity. But, um, but I think we're getting positive feedback on both, um, both units. Um, our intent is then after we get some feedback, make some revisions, figure out what teachers need to be able to feel successful doing these new units, that we would roll them out along with the third new third grade unit, which is a physics unit that would have to be piloted as well over the next um, several years. Um, and as we're writing these units, again, we're doing all of those things that I talked about before. We're trying to make sure we're providing students with opportunities to do science, we're integrating science with other disciplines and we're getting everyone really excited about what they're doing. And that's, that's the best part. Um, so the weather and climate unit was from Amplify 
And um, in this unit, students are learning about weather and climate um, in order to write a letter to the Wildlife Preservation Organization about which island would be the best place to put an orangutan reserve. So they learn about like the, different, the differences between weather in short-term climate and long-term, how would you um, look at that data? There was, um, these are some pictures from one of the Baker classrooms while they were learning about um, what was the most effective way to measure precipitation um, and why do we need standard, standardized measurements for things like that if we're going to be comparing different places. Um, there was a lot of engagement both with the students in the, um, in the concepts of the unit and the kind of this anchoring phenomena of figuring out the island for the orangutan. Um, and the teachers found the resources um, uh, very accessible to use, uh, very well done and um, well aligned to the third grade mentality. One of the teachers was joking that like she, um, she was doing this lesson and there was a note in the teacher's guide that like students are going to have trouble choosing who gets to go first in this lesson. So here are some things you can do with third graders to help them <laughs> with that group work skill. Um, so it like, it was very, um, it was very clear that the people who'd worked on this curriculum knew third graders, knew how to work with them and had, um, and had created a, a resource that teachers could use. Uh, the other thing that we did in this unit that was so exciting was we um, put this unit at the same time that they're doing their modeling data unit in Turk. So they were doing data and line plots and bar graphs in science to, to represent data and make comparisons and draw conclusions about weather and climate. Um, and they were doing the same thing at, in math class. And sometimes they would take their orangutan data and use that in one of their Turk lessons to make their graph instead of the set of data that was provided in the curriculum um, so that they didn't have to do them as two separate lessons. They could kind of really bring them together. So when we talk about that integration and that lining things up, um, we did this. And I went, again, I went to one of the pilot classrooms and the teacher was joking. She's like, yeah, the kids were telling me that we shouldn't call it science and math anymore. We should just call it data afternoon because we just are doing data the whole time. <laughs> So they were like, the kids were seeing the connection, the teachers were able to make that connection. I was able to work with the, um, the district math coaches to make sure that I could um, give really um, concrete examples to teachers about how to do that so that they didn't have to do the heavy lifting with everything else they're doing this year. Um, and it was a really positive, um, a positive way to do some of that alignment and integration. And now, so they just wrapped that up. They did that in um, October and early November. And now we're starting our life cycles and traits unit, which I'm super excited about. So this was the one that was homegrown. So teachers worked with me this summer. Um, we talked about the context and we divided up the lessons and we wrote the lessons and did the research. Um, and we are going to be raising trout and corn in the classroom to, um, to native species to Massachusetts. And um, the trout are going to be provided by um, the Department of Conservation and Fish and Wildlife. And it's part of a national wide trout in the classroom program. And they're going to use the trout and the corn to investigate life cycles. Um, and then they're going to look at the commonalities between life cycles of these two organisms um, and all other organisms on the planet. And they're also going to learn about how traits are passed down from parents to offspring and that, um, that the traits that we exhibit are often caused by an interaction of this inheritance pattern as well as interactions with the environment. So um, if, you are, um, if you are a fish and you are, uh, get a fin bitten off, you're, that's an interaction with the environment. But if you have um, green and brown spots, that's something that you inherit. So kind of learning about that differentiation. And today was the exciting day that the trout eggs came. So I, I was so excited. Leslie came over and I was like, the trout came, the trout came. So I, um, I was over at Baker and Runkle today. Um, they delivered the trout eggs. Each classroom has um, a little over a hundred eggs that they're going to start off with. Um, and they will observe them from this stage. Um, they'll watch them hatch and grow. 
Um, and then in the spring, though, we will release them in local waterways um, to be part of our Brookline um, ecosystem. So that is my presentation. And I know there's not a lot of time left, but I'm happy to take a few questions. And then I want to make sure that um, we have time for Ed to also share all the exciting things that are happening at the high school. Which I might just suggest, if it's okay with the committee, that we let Ed present and then come together for questions afterwards. Thank you, Emily. Amazing, as always. You make me so excited. I love to watch you because you're so excited. So I'm so excited. It's exciting stuff. Science is the best. It is. Ed, Ed will say the same, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but I don't have a slick presentation like that. So, oh well, um, well, well done, and, Emily. And, and, and I will say again, this was, we had K to eight on the agenda. And so I said, well, let me reach out to Ed. And Ed was gracious enough to just come and share some celebration. So that's okay, Ed, we didn't expect a, a slick presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, I, I have many things that I could talk about. Um, but in a nutshell, I think the, the, the greatest things right now, we're, we're dealing with moving in, we're still doing all of that, you know, finding boxes. Um, everything was, you know, well organized, it's all around, but just trying to figure out where everything goes, right? We, um, you move, if you've moved houses, you know, where are the, you know, where are the spatulas? Oh my God, you know, so they're in some box somewhere. And that's such a massive place in the STEM wing um, that I think teachers are mostly focused on how to use the spaces in the best ways to get the most out of the kids and having them coming back. Um, so along the lines of what Emily said, in terms of the 2016 uh, frameworks and the changes that they made, there have been a bunch of flip-flops in terms of the MCAS exam where they had to go back to the paper-based exam for 2021, even though we had already been on the road to going to the 2016 standards and the computer-based test. Um, so we, w there's been a bit of a whiplash in terms of that. Um, but mostly just for physics. Um, and I'd, I'd say that the biggest difference um, there would be that for, in the standards and how Emily got, uh, made a great presentation about how we're trying to get the students to um, engage more with the, the activities and have it be less content-based, it's still very content-based. And that is definitely an issue. Um, so one of the things that I kind of toyed around with when I, Leslie asked me to be here was just to take a look at the MCAS data, which um, I don't know how much we want to go revisit that whole scenario, but um, the state, um, the state reused, as far as I'm concerned, I'll say it, I, 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 this was public, they reused a lot of the questions that I had the students review with. So a lot of the students at the, after they had the exam last year said, Mr. Weiser, we saw the questions on the MCAS exam that we reviewed with. And so I went a little bananas and I wondered, I was worried about all sorts of things, but here's the interesting data. Here it comes. This is the, the bar graph that I can take a look at. The first thing that I go to every year, 2018, 2019, we had a large proportion, proportion of the kids getting advanced and proficient. It, uh, we skipped 2020. 2021, it was a very different picture. Then I was very worried about um, some of the, the subgroups, the, the demographics that we could pull out. So then I quickly went to African-American and Black, and this didn't make sense to me. See if you can, I hope this makes sense to you. 2018, these are results. I've never been happy with this, but it's the same basic structure. This is Hispanic Latino. 2018, 19, 21, fairly similar. Now our failure rates across the board went from one, 2% to five. So that obviously is a, a huge increase that way. Um, and definitely a number of students there were going to be supporting a lot of these students in uh, chemistry classes with some of the Title I funds. But it really made me wonder, what is going on here at, uh, in terms of this compared to this? Hopefully you get, if you have any questions about what I'm showing you, please feel, I, I, I would offer that up now because these Zoom meetings can go on. Okay. 
Okay, so then I decided to go a little bit deeper and compare us to other schools. So I pulled the data from the state So for introductory physics, I highlighted a few columns here. Brookline, near the top as we always are for percent um, proficient and advanced. The state, uh, state total 62% was the average. Um, here we are at 83. That's for all of the students. Oh, and I should add, I do do a little trick because there are a lot of schools that do have um, some subsets of their students who take the physics exam. So for instance, Lennox has 100% um, of the students getting advanced and proficient, but it's only a total of 22 of them. But if I look at the African-American black students, um, we were near the top here in terms of all the, the schools and the state in terms of getting prof uh, percent proficient and advanced. And Hispanic, and I changed it to uh, Latinx, um, basically tied for first with Arlington, but they only have uh, 20 students, we have uh, 70. So what this means to me, it's kind of a hypothesis, I, I don't really know. Um, it seems to me that our dedication during COVID to making sure that we provide the best education we could to um, the students who needed us the most had results, even though it doesn't look like much changed. It's a really interesting set of data to look at uh, because we really did not focus on teaching to the MCAS exam last year. Uh, and this year we are continuing to focus on social emotional learning and making sure that the students who need us the most are getting our most uh, the, the most attention um, as we move into the computer-based test that we know we're going to be getting for sure. The other big update is the state has definitely said goodbye to the chemistry exam after I believe the class of 2026. That press release just came out. Um, I just saw it for the first time this afternoon. Um, it came out, I think on the 7th of December. Um, but I think the biggest, um, so I should open it up for any questions about just like what you were looking at with the data, feel free. Ed, could you just remind me, they, students have a choice of which science test they take, is that? Not yeah. really. Okay. Um, in ninth grade, well, if we taught earth science in ninth grade, there wouldn't be an exam for them to take. Mm -hmm. So they don't really have a choice that way. So um, it's all ninth graders that take the MCAS exam in physics and it's a graduation requirement and it's all still going to be very content-based and they all have to learn that within September to um, the end of May, because the exam is the beginning of June. Um, so, you know, Ed, it was for me, what was interesting is that there wasn't a regression for, for the total population, there was a regression, a serious regression. But for the uh, African American or Latino kids, it seemed like because of whatever extra help they were getting, they stayed constant and didn't regress. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what I read into it. I don't know if that's what you're... That's what I was referring to, yes. I still would obviously love to have the same profile for every kid, no matter what they look like, whatever their background is, absolutely. So don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to sweep that under the rug, but I was very proud of the fact that, um, yeah, we're still, tops in the state when it comes to measuring us in uh, intro but, physics to other places. What would be important, I mean, I, I think I probably shouldn't be talking because I'm not an educator, but whatever we did at that time, if we do that together with in-class learning, we should get some better results, I think. I see Leslie you. shaking her head. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, and that's the thing. So what have we done differently in, uh, in physics? So uh, we've had um, the luxury of having a uh, innovation fund release for a number of teachers to, um, to help us reimagine physics. So this is basically our third big revision in teaching physics first. Um, and we're calling it experiential physics. So call it project-based learning. 
Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is to get the kids to use the brand new spaces. Obviously, Old Lincoln School, we're almost there. We're almost there, Susan. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But we are able to have the students work together and be very collaborative. So in a given classroom, you'll see the kids come into the room, know exactly what we're working on, and they will work in their pods. The desks will be for, put together, and they will be uh, sharing a lot of the work together, learning from each other, very collaborative. Um, and in terms of that identity curriculum, one of the things that we did, we I still can't believe we got this done, but we sent home last year kits of light bulbs, batteries, paper clips, um, other little doodads for the kids to make their own electric circuit projects. And the MCAS data actually shows that we blow the state away in terms of them understanding the difference between parallel and series circuits and how power gets used. And we had them, we used to have them make little dioramas, but with we tried to do something on Zoom where they would just make something two dimensional. And it might be something, I don't know, if they really, this one student who uh, he really loved the constellation Orion. I don't know how you get there, but he did. And so he made he made that and he was able to turn on the switch so that certain stars would would flicker. And um, another student would have it be about their cat. I'm guessing I'm making that up at this point. But the students were able to bring themselves to the project. And we're trying to get them to understand that they can bring that to science. It doesn't have to be super nerdy and all the scientists, they don't have to look like me in order to be great at science. So that's how we're kind of rolling in um, uh, identity and um, and personal preference and getting the kids to just um, shine and have fun with it. Um, one of the physics projects that's coming up um, as we're starting to, we used to have a pendulum lab, it would be very dry. We'd try to get the kids to understand the, the point of the hypothesis, um, but we found one great project-based learning thing where the kids pick a song that they like, and then they have to make a, any device oscillate to the frequency of that song. We'll see if they get there, but we have to really build up their skills first um, to, so that they know that they can use their data to go and um, do that. Um, so that's happening right now. But the other hard part is we're still packing up things, getting ready to move over. Um, so luckily we have all sorts of resources from when we were in the pandemic. Um, and other than that, I mean, I could go on and on about the work that we're doing um, in AP physics as well with um, and with coding. Um, and all sorts of other things, but I'll just kind of leave it there and see if you have any other questions, especially for Emily. She had a great presentation. And if I could just add, one of the things I'm really proud of is that in both these programs, um, the approaches that are taken here that really are very much like pro uh, project-based learning, which we know that that's what children and students, they really buy into. Um, and so that's really clear through Emily's presentation and what Ed shared. Um, and Helen, to your point, um, while we saw a drop overall in uh, science in MCAS at the high school level, we see that that's a statewide issue, right? And so that tells us something about the teaching of science during a pandemic. I don't know what it quite tells us, um, but it tells us that 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 was tough. And so, um, you know, given that, you know, Brookline continues to be at the top and, and we strive for continuous improvement all the time, um, I really appreciate Ed's attention um, to more vulnerable populations. Um, and so it's exactly what you said, Helen, what we see is that some of the interventions that have been put in place at the high school around science, they work. And so what do we need to do to continue that work? Um, so those are the lessons learned um, that I'm really interested in and how we continue to replicate them and keep them in place. And I'll be quiet. I'm so excited. This is so exciting. I loved it. your enthusiasm, both of you, uh, Emily and Ed, is, is infectious. And so um, it's just lovely to hear how excited you are about science, because I know that that spreads to others. Um, and I'm really excited to hear about all this really interesting project-based learning that's going on and the, the interest in heading in that direction, getting kids' um, hands into science, I think is um, so exciting, oh, but I'm, I know I'm biased. My, I, my, my master's is in science ed, so I'm a little, I'm a little biased. So I'll just throw that out there, but it is, it's really exciting. And I think kids get excited. And I think Leslie said this, 
or maybe it was Emily or Ed or all of you that kids really get invested when they're able to put more of themselves into a project and they're able to, to get their hands on a project. Um, and it really <clears throat> increases their engagement and their investment in their learning and really makes it into a, a long-term process and um, into their mind. So I thank you both for coming. I'm, I'm very excited. I don't know if other members have um, specific questions. A lot of mine got answered. As I was jotting them down, they got answered along the way. So um, I'm really glad that you both could join us because I know one of the things that's really important to us is, is the continuity from K-8 to the high school. And so I, I, I love that we're all here together to have this conversation. Susan, your hand, I think I saw. Yeah, no, this is this is so exciting. Um, so thank you, Emily. Thank you, Ed. And thank you to all the, the, the teachers who are working on this. It's just... Um, I think it's come such a long way from the kinds of things we wanted to be able to do to the kinds of things that you all are making happen. So that's just, it's incredibly exciting. Um, I had two questions. One is, um, We've talked a lot about sort of making learning visible, and certainly a lot of the design in the high school um, is designed to do that. And you know, and obviously, so much of the project-based work lends itself to that. So I'm wondering if you know, since we're doing it more than we were when we were kind of all in small, you know, contained classrooms, um, we all, obviously we people were always doing it to some extent, but hopefully we're creating more opportunities to do it now. Um, kind of what that's done to the conversations and the and the kinds of ways that the kids are engaging with the materials. Um, so that would be my first question. And my second one is just sort of what what do you need from us, right? What can what can we do to uh, be helpful and be supportive? Because um, I think there are a lot of fans of science education overall, but just um, specifically, you know, you guys and the work you're doing. So just the question I always ask, Ed's probably sick of hearing it at this point, but the question I always ask, which is like, what is it that we can, what can we do to be supportive? Um, so in terms of making student thinking visible, one of the really big um, pieces of this anchoring phenomena work is having students create models that they revise over time to explain the phenomena. And then they share those models among each other and then build class consensus models and really think about how is our ability to explain this, this phenomena getting more and more scientifically accurate? What questions do we still have that we want to explore? So there's um, a big part in that piece. And then also last year with our work with the Museum of Science and the anchoring phenomena in the middle school, um, teachers have started um, doing some of the same phenomena and the same projects at different schools. And then they can compare how their students are approaching that task with how students, so how, how Heath students are, are approaching that task to how students at Driscoll are approaching it. And they can really learn from each other as teachers. So that curriculum embedded professional development that Leslie was talking about at the very beginning of the meeting um, gets embedded in that. Um, and then in terms of, um, of support from the, the school committee, um, new curriculum is exciting and it also uh, costs money for the the trout in the classroom, for example. There's um, there's setups of the aquariums and things like that. Um, so as much as uh, we are jumping into the the deep end of the budget process right now, as we come and say like here's what we're trying to do and and here's what it's going to cost. But I think those costs will will bring us a lot for the for the investment. Um, but support in that is always helpful. Ed. Yeah, um, uh, thanks for posing the question, Susan. I think, well, um, your first piece about how making um, learning visible. I think the greatest, most recent example I have is when the students in my class looked through the, you know, through the glass wall, the curved one of um, room 208, across the hall, and they saw what was going on in the medical careers class. Um, it was just a presentation, but they're like, Oh, that's so gross. What is that? And they were watching some surgery. I think I don't know if it was the open heart surgery or what. And they're like, wait, what is that? Oh, that's disgusting. I can't look. Wait, what's the course? Wait, we have that course. And so that type of thing is happening right now. Um, aside from, you know, a few posters getting put up on the walls, but just really seeing what's going on in the classrooms, I think it's been really powerful. Um, and there's more to come with that too. Um, can, I, can I just really quickly add that? Like as a central office administrator, being able to stand at that intersection in the science building and see four or five, six classrooms at once 
even just in a low key way and not to have to, like I've had a teacher wave me in like that knows me, like it's a little bit like going to Pierce where I knew I didn't have to like open somebody's door to visit their classroom. <laughs> it's like, they just can see me, but I can also see them. And it just feels much more comfortable to enter a classroom on the fly. Yeah, it, it, definitely. It's fun that way. And oh, yeah, in terms of the support though, and in, in addition to the fact that now that we have this uh, big space and we've had a, um, you know, a, a sizable amount of the ff &E budget to be able to support what we've got going on here. Um, I think things like, so just making sure that there's enough in the budget to support all of the new buildings that we have. Um, you know, if we have all this glass, if we can't clean it, it's going to look really lousy over the, the next few years. So like really trying to plan out that and, and see that. But in terms of the MCAS exam, I wonder this, and we tried to come up with this many years ago in terms of um, common assessments, and we have common assessments here, but what, what could we measure ourselves against if the MCAS exam is the thing that everybody has to, I don't know, I, like we just have to do that. It's a, ter it's a terrible exam. I'm just gonna put that out there. And when kids have to take the exam on small screens and they're gonna have to flip through a whole series of graphs and data in order to get back and forth to measure, answer one specific question, I have problems with that. So is there something else that you'd be interested in for us to be able to measure, to be able to be really proud of? I think that is something that we should consider in the future. Let's make one quick comment on that, Jennifer. I think we, you know, a number of years back for people who are here, there was, you know, the common grade level assessments, you know, K-8, you know, beginning of year, end of year test across, you know, all the math classrooms. And it was something that Brookline educators designed. They said, here's what we want kids to be able to know coming into third grade. And here's what we want them to know, ideally at the end of third grade. And it was a really nice way because we had, you know, eight different buildings. It was a really nice way for the, for the educators to kind of get together and calibrate it. So not only weren't we reliant on MCAS, but we kind of all knew, I mean, just kids have different gaps, especially when kids come in new and kids have different um, experiences before, before Brookline um, or different countries and different educational systems. So I just, I really think that anything that, uh, that educators are developing in terms of like, what is it that we want our kids to be able to know and do in a common way that's not sort of, again, MCAT top down, you know, any of that, but it's, it's, here's what we value in education. Here's what we, here's what means something to us um, in, with some sort of equity, I think I, I will personally be, be quite in favor of. So, so thank you for that. I really, I think it's a great question to ask. Yes, I, I know we're a little behind on time and I really want to be mindful of that. I saw, I see Helen and Suzanne, but I know we, we, need, we do need to be mindful. I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm just going to jump in. I'm so sorry, guys. I, um, I have to pick up my daughter. I'm going to jump back on when I get in the car. I know the OTL leadership team will take any notes for me, but if you're still on, I'll be joining back in just a minute or two. Thank you, Leslie. Um, go ahead, Helen, and so, then Suzanne. First of all, a suggestion, we may want to start at 4.30 so we don't run into this each time. That's number one. But number two, first of all, thank you so much, both of you, for your presentations. And um, Emily, I'm just, I'm blown away by some of this stuff. I'm really, I mean, it's what we've been asking for. But what I'm worried about is when I looked at your timeline, you're not actually starting to roll it out until 2023. So that's another year and a half from now, as opposed to sooner. And is that because of finance or is it because of inability to do things that quickly? Uh, that that was just, that's um, it was fiscal year 2023, which is next school year. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I, I <laughs> yes, it would be clear. next fall, yes. Okay, terrific. That, no, then I'm happy. <laughs> I'm really happy. <laughs> Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Suzanne? Yeah, just quickly, I just actually piggybacking on what Susan said. Um, so, you know, a, a project based relies a lot on what we used to call consumables. I don't know if you still call them that, but, um, and, and so that means that you don't buy a textbook once and it's good for five or 10 years. You have to, every year, you have to replenish your materials and supplies because that's, what, how they learn. Uh, and so I guess we really need to take a, a hard look at what it's what your budget needs are in terms of uh, consumables and 
replacements of materials. And so um, somehow that needs to happen. I don't, I'm not sure how, but again, taking a hard look at, at what you need in terms of uh, budget requirements so that we be sure, we're sure to support you in the way that needs to happen. Absolutely, I think that's so important because without those consumables being replenished, educators can't do those really mm -hmm. awesome lessons and we, we have to get that stuff into kids' hands. So um, I think that's so important. So as we approach this budget cycle or as we are in this budget cycle, um, you know, we encourage you to, to bubble that up um, to where, wherever it needs to be. Um, do folks have other questions? I mean, I, I, that was really informative, really great to hear a lot of that information, exciting. Um, we don't always get to hear the sort of on the ground things that are happening. So this is really nice to, to get this information. Did anyone have any other questions? I am gonna, I have I have a daughter to bring to clarinet. So um, if there are questions for science, I am so happy to answer them. You can always email me um, or uh, we can set up a time to do further conversations. But, um, but if uh, Michelle or Gabe, if there are questions that I should weigh in on, um, just let me know and I will get that information to whoever needs it as quickly as possible. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, Emily, so much. Thanks, and Emily. Ed, I think uh, I think we're ready to move on to our final piece. So please feel feel free to go. You've been waiting and on this for a long time with us. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time. No worries. Good to see you all. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, let's see. So we have. Um, a, do, does anyone have new business that they want to bring up that we could put on the table? And then we have. Then I do know some of us have a hard stop in like five ten minutes. But we Jennifer, I have a um, quick piece of new business and then I have to uh, run. I have my daughter with me here in the office. Um, uh, I would love to put on the docket, if not the January meeting or the February meeting um, for curriculum subcommittee to talk about reviewing, um, understanding our um, differences and similarities oh, yeah. program. Um, last year, we put it on pause given that it's an in-person uh, program, and I thought this would give us an opportunity to really review uh, the program. I know that um, the our district on its own has created some units to add on to the Newton developed program. Um, and to my knowledge, it hasn't been reviewed. So I'd love to um, really do a more comprehensive dive into the program, uh, the curriculum, um, especially if we're talking about you know, using time during our students' um, uh, uh, day. Yeah, that's really, yeah, that's interesting. So we're not doing that this year. I know part of it, I'm not sure where it fell within the budget. And then also, I know it's typically an in-person. I know um, I know that it is also being done, not necessarily in Brookline, I mean, in Brookline, um, as a sort of teacher-run remote partial activity it, it, you know, like hybrid version um, without volunteers coming in. So I don't know if that's something that will stay or maybe when COVID protocols change, it will go back to something, to, it could be something that goes full in person. Um, but I think just having the conversation about looking at what are the pieces that we run and how we run it and, you know, what is the, you know, um, the person investment and, and what are the units will be really Good to, to sort of take a look at. Um, I know we haven't had that conversation in curriculum since I've been on the committee larger. So um, I, I have that down in my notes and, and we can definitely um, talk some more about that. Okay, that's great. great. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so on that note, unless there's other new business, I think it's time for us all to um, get back to our, to our families and um, the rest of our work. But thank you all so much. I know that you're taking the extra time to do this. So thank you so much to all the staff who could join us and all our committee members. Have a great night. Everybody. Great vacation, everybody. Yes. Bye-bye. Have a great vacation.